Harley Weeks, I cover health for the Globe and Mail. So since the beginning of 2020, I've had the fun job of doing pandemic sort of nonstop and uh, the one subject we're probably all sick of hearing about. Um, but I think it's a really unique position, one where we get to learn about some of the really exciting, great things that are going on, not just all of the bad health news, but some of the really exciting good things that are happening in the health space. Um, and that's sort of where this conversation is going to be going today. Some of the things that are going on, some of the future possibilities, some of the changes um, that we're seeing and more changes that are needed to really open up uh, the biotech landscape and beyond in Canada. Um, so we have a really stellar lineup of people who are gonna take us through all of that. Um, and just by way of, of sort of the backdrop, I mean, I think we've all seen, uh, you know, with the, the ravages of COVID-19 and, and all of the bad that it's brought. But at the same time, there have been some, some bright spots, uh, you know, namely the fact that we were able to see a vaccine, uh, several vaccines developed in, in record time. Um, I think it's just a testament to the, the current pace of scientific research and development and, and the future possibilities. And um, we're really lucky to have this group assembled here to speak about some of that and some other things that are going on uh, with science and biotech and beyond. Uh, so I'll introduce everyone, starting first with on, the, on your left, uh, Carolina Valente, who is CEO and CSO of Voxel Bio Innovation. Uh, who made it here luckily yesterday after a very long uh, delay with the airport closed in Victoria. So thank you for, for making the trip. Uh, we also have Brendan Fry, who is founder, CEO, and chief engineer of Deep Genomics. Uh, and joining us via Zoom behind us here, you can see Carl Hansen, chairman, CEO, and president of Abcelera. So thank you all for being here and for joining us. And um, I'll indicate, Carl, when we want you to chime in, but also feel free to elbow your way into the conversation. Don't be shy. Um, sure. So we'll start off by talking uh, maybe to Brendan a little bit about information technology and um, how all of the different, um, you know, things that are going on in that space and also, um, you know, innovations and evolution in open science have really changed the way um, business is being done right now, innovation, research, um, and the way companies are being f formed. And I can tell you're so already ready to go, so <laughs> take it away. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and Carl, one thing I'm wondering is, can you see what you look like here? You're, you're, you're this giant picture looking over our shoulders. <laughs> I, I, I can't see it, but, uh, but that's probably a good thing. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so uh, Global Data recently published a report that talked about the most dominant factors that we're going to see in the pharmaceutical industry in, in 2022. And big data and artificial intelligence were at the top. And later down the list was genomics. So those are key areas. And uh, just on the topic of artificial intelligence and information technology, uh, we founded Deep Genomics in 2015, so I've uh, been with this company and building this company for, for seven years now, and I've seen how information technology plays out in a company where it is the core of the company, not just a, a something bolted onto the side of the company, but the core of the company. And I think what's important to think about here is that artificial intelligence is not magical, Artificial intelligence is an engineering tool. It requires uh, digital information, first of all. That's key, digital information. It works best when it's predicting cause and effect relationships, which are important for drug discovery and development. And then the third thing is it requires huge amounts of data. I think all of us have heard about that, that AI works when you have huge amounts of data. And, and so that's really critical when you're thinking about how information technology and AI will, will disrupt the pharmaceutical industry. Now, at Deep Genomics, I can just briefly tell you what our approach has been. It's been to focus on RNA therapeutics. And so Carly mentioned Moderna or the COVID-19 vaccines, which are RNA therapeutics, and also Spinraza for spinal muscular atrophy is an RNA therapeutic. And the reason Deep Genomics decided to focus on RNA therapeutics is because they are literally a digital sequence of information. So the COVID-19 vaccine is literally a sequence of A's, C, G's, and T's. There's chemistry that's wrapped around it to get into your cells, but it is a digital sequence. So it's perfectly matched to artificial intelligence. As I said, AI requires digital information. And then the second important piece here is that RNA biology uh, has lots of digital information associated with it. There's over 100 petabytes of an RNA biology data, just vast amounts of data. And as I mentioned, that's the third thing you need uh, in order to have a successful AI system. So those are some of the key ingredients that I think are needed uh, in order to build a successful AI component or an AI therapeutics company. 
Thanks for that. And, and Carl, I might just ask you to jump in, and then uh, Carolina as well. Um, you know, the theme, I guess, that we're talking about is sort of, you know, this decentralization idea and sort of, um, you know, maybe the democratization of how, uh, you know, science is being distributed and how companies are being formed and, and how, you know, scientists um, such as yourselves are actually able to kind of really be new innovators, like kind of disrupting the old way things were done before. Um, you know, Carl, obviously you have uh, a lot of experience in this area and, and just wondering your, your perspective or take on some of the challenges that are in that space right now or how, you know, you've, you know, done such an amazing job and you've done such amazing work. Is, is, that, is that possible for others in, in Canada right now? I mean, what do you think um, some of the challenges and opportunities are? Uh, thanks for the question. There's probably several threads I could pull on there. Um, you know, on the uh, maybe just a quick comment on the on the data science side. I think I agree uh, very much with what uh, what Brendan said on a lot of that. Um, you know, AI is not the Star Trek computer. It can't uh, conjure up therapeutics out of nothing. Uh, this is really a game about data. Uh, one of the things I'd also add on top of that that people often forget is the power of software and data systems to organize and scale companies, um, which is something that is. You know, long, it's been known forever uh, within many sectors. It, that's not a theme that has really hit biotechnology or the pharmaceutical industry uh, based primarily on the fact that the big companies uh, were built and laid the foundation for their businesses uh, long before that was a thing. So new companies coming into space have that opportunity. Um, and that, you know, that is something that we are embracing a lot. And one of the things that allows us, uh, we believe in the long term, uh, to scale and to start to uh, really respond to this theme of decentralization, which you brought up. And so maybe I'll just, you know, say a little bit about that. Um, you know, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, 30 years ago in the space we work, antibody therapeutics, there were a small number of companies that had the means to go from an idea through to a drug. Um, and those companies, you know, were technology companies that developed that capacity and then they turned their mind and their attention onto what you would naturally do uh, once you've crossed those hurdles, and that is to make and sell and market and test therapeutics. Uh, over the last 30 years, um, the success of our particular sector, antibody therapeutics, has attracted a huge amount of innovation. That's a very healthy thing for an ecosystem. So, you know, many new targets, many entrepreneurs that have new ideas or ways to use antibody therapeutics. And what we saw is, um, a real structural problem in those ideas and entrepreneurs connecting with all of the technology and capability and know-how that are needed to bring those actually forward into clinical testing. Um, so, you know, that theme of decentralization is at the core of what Abseller has set out to do. Uh, we took the approach of building a company that would be a, a centralized uh, discovery engine that could cover all of these steps from idea through to clinical testing and that would allow other companies, small companies, to um, you know, use us as a platform on which to develop their therapeutics. Um, that's a theme you've seen in the technology sector, not something that has existed in the biotech sector, and one we think can be quite powerful uh, to unlocking you know, many good ideas and uh, the, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit in a lot of these centers that is currently, uh, currently held back because it's a tough slog to develop a therapeutic from nothing. Um, so that's you know that's uh, what uh, that, that's how we see our role at, in decentralization. Um, uh, you asked about Canada. I mean, we've built a company here in Canada uh, against you know against probably high odds, and I think one of the things that was really instrumental in that is um, being able to look at the industry for, with fresh eyes to see an opportunity, and then to start to recognize the advantages that we have in our ecosystem and not trying to mimic how other companies are built in other sectors that have other strengths. Um, I think I see that I see that theme present in pretty much all of the biotech companies that have risen uh, to notoriety here in Canada. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> and, and Carolina, I'll throw that to you because, um, you, you know, your company is also very ambitious with a lot of really big plans, but, you know, um, we see how uh, regulatory hurdles can get in the way and, and that kind of thing. You know, obviously, I think that's a common theme in Canada and, and beyond when we're in the, you know, talking about the healthcare space. Um, but just maybe you could reflect a little bit on that. I mean, and how do you kind of try to overcome some of those challenges that um, often feel like they're out of your control? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. What we have 
seen and what we know is that the drug development process is broken. It has been broken for years and it's highly cemented. And it wasn't until COVID, I would say, that we saw that that could actually be broken, the, the, the process of decentralization. And um, what we have been seeing now, especially talking about more of the regulatory process, is a huge push now to decrease the number of animal models. So the FDA Modernization Act was a bill proposed in October um, last year, and it was really going towards finding new in vitro platforms to decrease the number of animal models. And it has been very, very good for Canada because there is a lot of companies here working in that preclinical stage, whether it is even in silico and then in vitro, but really finding ways to revolutionize that um, drug development process. And this is exactly what we are doing at Voxel. We are aiming to really come as a game changer for the preclinical testing, as a better platform to test drugs in vitro. And I like to refer to them as artificial biopsy samples. So we are using bioprinting, that is a new technology, to really um, create these tissue models um, that will allow testing those drugs in a more meaningful way. And then going back to what Brandon and Carl were saying, now we are seeing is basically the drug research going towards these small companies to find that innovative approach, and that approach not coming just directly from the big pharma anymore. Um, well, I'll start another go around, and you, you all may want to jump in here, uh, but I'll start with you, Brendan. And so you mentioned big pharma, and um, you know I've heard it said to me by a number of people that in order to really find success, um, it, it's much more uh, easy to just partner up with a hospital or a pharmaceutical company or basically a large entity that kind of already has an established footprint and, and to seek the path of commercialization that way. Um, Brendan, I imagine you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, um, so it depends on what you mean by partnership. Uh, and there's actually a few threads here that I'd like to bring together. Carl um, alluded to making use of what's uniquely can uh, Canadian when building a Canadian biotech. Um, and so one, one component is the culture of a startup company. Uh, the culture of the company, I like to think of it like a seedling. When you plant a seedling, right, it's just a tiny little seedling. You need to give it just the right amount of nourishment. You need to take into account how much sunlight it's getting and, and other conditions that it's, that it's growing up in. And eventually it becomes a big tree, right? Big farm is like the big tree. Once you're a big tree, you can't easily change things. You can't move it around. If you take a giant tree and move it into the shade, it'll probably die. Seedlings are much more flexible, but once you develop a seedling, it will have embedded in it the culture that then takes it forward into becoming that big tree. So the reason I talk about all of this is that for a startup company, uh, if it's going to partner with another company, no matter whether it's a big pharma uh, or a hospital or another startup, it's super important that the cultures are well aligned, uh, super important that, the, that there's alignment on core values. Uh, so for example, at Deep Genomics, all of our targets have rock solid science behind them. So our targets are not um, sort of throw, throw it at the wall and see what sticks kinds of targets. These are targets that are well proven biologically. But some companies are willing to throw something at the wall and see what sticks. And some, sometimes the companies don't know whether it's a good target until fa a phase three study. That's not what we do at Deep Genomics. Our targets are well defined genetically or have proof at the level of protein. Uh, and so things like that are super important in the partnership. And at Deep Genomics, we've only chosen to partner with companies where we have clear alignment on who's responsible for what and where we both have a line of sight in terms of what success will look like. So both we and our partner know what success is going to look like. We're ready to race ahead and get there together. We've avoided partnerships that are nebulous, not well-defined, uh, and some partnerships, uh, they fail because the advocate in the other company disappears, moves on, or gets promoted within that company, and they're no longer there to support the partnership. So that's been our focus, and it's worked out quite well. Carl could, and then uh, Carolina, I'd ask you to just jump in on the same thing. And yeah, sorry, Carl, go ahead, your perspective. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would agree, uh, you know, very much on the importance of, um, you know, uh, a cultural fit and good relationships in any partnership. I think that's that's probably a, a universal truth in partnering. Um, maybe I'll take it also sort of from the practical side. So if you're talking about biotech from the perspective of drug development, 
the reality is that you know bringing a drug to market is you know one of the hardest, riskiest, longest, most expensive propositions in any sector. Full stop. So you're talking about what has, on average, been a 10-year journey with a 5% success rate that all in will cost about $900 million. And once you get it there, then you need to figure out how to actually market it and get it to patients. Uh, so the, the type of enterprise that's needed to do that successfully um, looks nothing like a startup. So I'm, I'm laying that out because the reality is in this sector, if you are doing drug development of any kind, uh, you're ultimately partnering uh, until you've achieved that critical mass. And there are some examples of companies that have taken things all the way forward. Um, but they are, you know, by far the exception. So partnering is, is mission critical in biotech and drug development. Um, and, you know, th that's a good thing. I think what, what is important for a startup to realize is uh, not every company is good to partner with and you need to find uh, the right synergy. So a big company will always have the scale, they'll have the capital, they'll have probably the clinical development capabilities, um, at least for, for late stage development that a small company won't have. Um, you also need to find where you can insert yourself into that value chain and really create value in the partnership. Um, and that will be different for different companies. So um, I, I think my advice for people starting would be, you know, to think about the technology problems, uh, you know, first from where could we really move the needle, a 10x improvement at least in some important part of that value chain. And then once you've done that, figure out how you can start to you know, capture more and more of that value chain and uh, scale your company and become more of an even player. Um, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do. It's very much a business perspective, but it's at least as important as the technology. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So Voxel is a brand new company compared to Upseller and Deep Genomics. And I think there is a lot of expectation that partnerships just happen out of nowhere. And it's quite hard. It's quite hard for a new company to find that perfect fit. And goes back to the cultural fit, go back to not being nebulous when talking about IP, when talking about everything, when partnerships. So it's, it's definitely an expectation that I think a lot of um, um, investors especially have in the beginning when funding startups, but it's something that is, it's hard. It's hard to find that perfect fit. Um, so Carolina, as someone who, you know, is just saying sort of the newer face here, I mean, do you see a lot of the opportunity that we hear so much about maybe in some of the headlines, you know, that we, we're hearing how Canada is kind of entering this new phase where there's so much opportunity and for growth. Um, do you feel that that on the ground, like that is, that is true or, or is there still just I mean, too much standing in the way. Um, I think partially true, that's what I would say. Um, that is still a lot of expectations of startups having to have everything figured out, I think, when involving partnership, having to have all the answers, which we definitely don't. We are learning as we go and we are developing a new technology. There's a lot of challenges on developing a new technology. And that's the whole point of a partnership, right? The whole point is to get that development faster. Can you hear me? Yeah. To get that development faster and to grow that, comp that, that technology faster. Um, so I think it's partially true. Um, Carl, so you had touched on the idea of, of partnership and obviously that was something that, um, you know, helped bring your antibody treatment to market quickly. I'm assuming that was a key element. But what were some of the other things that, that you could um, attribute that success to? You know, really remarkable timelines and an achievement in something that really made a meaningful difference to so many people in the pandemic. Uh, thanks for that question. So, um, you know, maybe I'll sort of briefly uh, give a history of that. I think it, it sort of, you know, highlights, um, uh, highlights uh, how we became set up to make a, a, a really big contribution to the COVID-19 response. Um, the first thing I'll say is that it, it probably looks from the outside uh, like Absolver success happened very suddenly um, in 2020 uh, when we were, I'd say, catapulted the limelight with the success for COVID-19. Uh, but like, like any of those stories, you know, that is um, that's sort of an overnight success that took over a decade in the building. Uh, so we, we spent, uh, from founding the company and in my career, probably since, you know, 2000, so over 20 years now, working on technologies that would allow you to make uh, faster, more accurate, different types of biomedical uh, or uh, measurements in biomedical research. Um, Abcelera was set up entirely to put together 
all of those technologies in a full workflow um, that ultimately goes from idea right through to IND, and to do that um, at greater speed and efficiency than is than it was previously previously been possible. Um, so we have spent you know the last decade uh, being fast uh, at at looking at searching through natural immune systems and finding antibodies that could be repurposed. Uh, prior to the the pandemic, we had even been working for over two years uh, through a contract with the Department of Defense on applying our technology specifically for the problem of rapid pandemic response. So the concept uh, funded by the US government uh, that was quite prescient here and deserves a lot of credit for having done the preparation was uh, someone comes off the plane, they've been infected, um, you get a blood sample and you can quickly scan through the immune system to find an antibody that could be manufactured and could then be redeployed uh, either as a firebreak or as a therapeutic uh, for, for the pandemic. And so we were able to do that uh, very quickly, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we came up with the first antibody uh, that went from discovery uh, to clinical testing in less than three months. So a, uh, a world record, I think, still in terms of the speed of therapeutic development. Uh, and that was done not by ourselves, but by recognizing early that we needed to build relationships with uh, like-minded and well-enabled uh, large partners that had the ability to do the manufacturing, the clinical trials, and uh, the commercial sales. And we're very fortunate to connect Eli Lilly on that front. Um, so, you know, the, the, the sort of abstract answer would be, uh, we, had, we have uh, prioritized at our company uh, capability building uh, that is, you know, focused on bringing all tools to bear on being faster and more efficient at getting ideas right through to clinical development. And, you know, that, um, you know, that, that preparation put us in a position where we could take advantage of uh, an opportunity that presented itself to show that this technology works and can have an impact. And I, I, I believe and hope that uh, this is only the first time we do that. And we're, of course, working on many things apart from COVID-19, where the timelines are not nearly so compressed, but uh, the stakes are every bit as high. Thank you for that. And <clears throat> certainly it seemed like during the pandemic, um, so many things did move very quickly, and I think that while timelines may not be so compressed going forward, um, it showed certainly a number of policymakers in Canada, you can move quickly. There, you, you, we don't have to be at a glacial pace for everything. And, and Brendan, I was just wondering if you could weigh in here. Um, you know, your company's obviously, um, you know, earned its share of headlines for, for all of the success that you've had. And I'm wondering from that sort of, um, you know, unique Canadian standpoint, what are some of the things that you find um, are really working for companies, for, for, for small, smaller ones and, and bigger ones like yours? And what are some of the things that continue to frustrate you about the, the way things are in Canada right now? Sure, thanks for that question. Yeah, the Canadian environment is a wonderful one, but also has some odd aspects to it. Um, one comment I do want to make though, Carl talked about speed. And at Deep Genomics, we've, we've got speed down pat, but we've also realized that actually what's even more important than speed is doing work early on so as to maximize the probability of success. Uh, when you go into the clinic, you tend to spend a lot more money than you do in preclinical research. And so if you can increase the probability of success by say 10%, that turns out to be e extremely important. So I just wanted to make that comment. And at Deep Genomics, we're focusing a lot right now on increasing probability of success. So the Canadian environment, I, I, first of all, things have changed a lot in Canada in the last 15 years when it comes to entrepreneurs and the startup environment. It's really good now in Canada for a few different reasons, and I'll talk about those. Um, and I think there's, there's three components that are important for success of a biotech in Canada. One of them is a specialized workforce. The second one is an environment that engages the employees with meaningful work, so they feel good about the work and they want to stay committed. And the third one is access to capital. Uh, now, the first one, when it comes to a specialized workforce, Canada produces world-leading scientists and engineers, uh, both in terms of experimental biology, molecular cell biology, animal biology, and then also for us, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Toronto is the epicenter of AI and deep learning. Um, uh, one, one place in which Canada needs more of is experienced drug developers. So Boston and the Bay Area are ahead of us when it comes to experienced drug developers, but as I, as I heard earlier on, Places like Toronto and, and, and Vancouver and Montreal are catching up. Uh, the second one is engaging people in meaningful work, and I think that cannot be underestimated. As we've all been talking about, it takes uh, many, many years to take a drug from concept all the way through clinical trials to commercialization. 
And it's important to have employees that are willing to commit to your company and stay focused on their work for a long period of time. And other areas like Boston are actually struggling with that. In Boston, people move on quite quickly from job to job, uh, seeking ever-escalating uh, salaries and, and, um, and title as well. Uh, and I think in that sense, Canada has a unique advantage. Uh, people in Canada, they're very smart, they're hardworking, and they also uh, are humble in the sense that they're willing to sort of take, take, a, uh, take a step back and say, I'll do whatever is best for the company, I'll do whatever is best for the team, I'll do whatever is best for the patients, ultimately. And so I think, uh, I think that's an advantage that Canada has. And the third one is access to capital. When I first started raising money for Deep Genomics in 2015, I couldn't find the right capital in Canada on the right terms. The investors were too conservative. I ended up in the Bay Area raising money from uh, True Ventures. And uh, it turns out now True Ventures has moved into Toronto and has now funded 10 companies in Toronto, including other biotechs. Uh, and so there's two parts to that story. First of all, I had to go to the Bay Area to get money originally, but now there are VCs, international VCs that have moved into Canada. But even more exciting is that there are Canadian VCs that are stepping up to make big bets now. In our most recent round, the Canadian pension fund, CPPIB, invested in deep genomics as well as uh, Amplitude Ventures. And so we're starting to see now Canadian VCs willing to put big money into higher risk uh, ventures. And uh, Caroline, I wanted to ask you to weigh in on there as well. Um, so that is really exciting to see that Canada is kind of getting that recognition that it's not just uh, the Bay Area anymore, that kind of thing. Um, from your perspective, do you feel as though um, you know, things are heading in that, in that right direction? What are some of the things that continue to maybe um, frustrate you or things that have gone really well that, that you want to build on? Um, on the access to capital, I think things are becoming easier here in Canada, especially with grants, because for a long time, U.S. was the main point to get grants, and Canada is definitely picking it up. So we were able to raise um, very close to 700,000 U.S. dollars in grant in one year, which is, which is very, very good. Um, in regarding what Brandon was saying um, about talent, what is interesting is we have been seeing, especially for a small startup like us growing, is that is talent is just hard to retain because the competition is so big. Um, the competition is so big going to US and getting that those jobs, especially when talking about highly specialized talent like PhDs, which Canada has a lot of uh, PhDs that are fantastic. And competing with that, competing with US, I think that has been one of the frustrating parts. If, if I could uh, maybe, uh, maybe um, you know, comment and amplify a little bit of what was said before. Um, you know, I, I would agree that, you know, the, uh, apart from the later stage of drug development uh, and perhaps even senior leadership, where if you're a new ecosystem, it's going to be more difficult. Uh, I believe we have a, uh, a big talent advantage in Canada. Um, so we have an, a terrific, well-trained workforce, people that want to live and stay here, and they need only the opportunities, uh, to join companies that are doing something exciting. Uh, so our, our, um, I've often said our ability to build a company like Abcelera uh, here is much, much better than it would be in one of the major centers for exactly the reasons that, that Brendan highlighted. Uh, on the capital side, um, I think that, you know, there's a lot, been a lot said and we definitely want to have a very robust uh, venture capital and, you know, private investment uh, ecosystem, particularly for the early stage companies, that risk taking is important, but capital will go across borders to find quality opportunities. And you see that, you know, if you build a company that's doing something interesting and gets traction um, in a good market, and of course we're getting some headwinds right now, uh, but even, even in a bad market, the good companies will be able to raise money and sustain their operations. Um, so capital is global. I think the problem is one uh, much more of network. So we're a big country, we're sparsely populated uh, in, in an absolute sense and definitely in terms of companies in this sector. So you, you don't get that natural uh, mixing and networking and exposure that you get if you're in one of the big centers. Uh, so that's probably the biggest disadvantage in Canada. And I would uh, absolutely you know, give advice to young people uh, or anyone starting a company, you need to get out of the office, you need to get to the places uh, where the other companies are, where the investors are. 
Um, because if you're if you're not present and not known, you're going to miss those opportunities on the business development side and on the um, uh, and on the financing side. Uh, but uh, if you make that effort, you can compensate for it. And if if asked to choose between having a remarkable workforce that is loyal to a company and helps us scale uh, versus that network effect, I would choose to be here in Canada. I think it's been very much you know to our advantage to be here. That's a really nice note to, to sort of leave the formal portion of this panel on. And um, we have just a couple of minutes left for a couple of audience questions, if there are any. So please raise your hands. One right there. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Afrin Shirazi, and I'm here from Northeastern University. So my question here is how decentralized clinical trial can be used for drug development, and what are the measures taken for the compliance-related issue and just to overcome that? Thank you. I'm not sure who, want, who wants to jump in there first. Uh. <laughs> it's, it's a good question, but at, at Deep Genomics, we're focusing on targets where the clinical trials can be very efficiently run and are small. So I don't have a lot to say on it, unfortunately. Um. Yeah, we'll add to that, it's, we are really focused on the preclinical side. So the clinical, the clinical trials is still a big problem. Um, when talking with big pharmaceutical companies, they, they keep saying the same thing. It's we we'll need to get those drugs to the clinical trials because that's when they're going to fail. So the faster we can get those drugs to the clinical trial, that's what we are trying to do um, with Voxel. But Carl, maybe you can add a few words there. Yeah, um, because I probably don't have anything particularly insightful directly on point, uh, maybe I'll take it as an opportunity to highlight you know, something that we could do better in Canada. Um, you know, one of the one of the consequences of having uh, a nascent and evolving biotech sector is that we do not have nearly uh, the clinical trial capability um, that there are in other sectors. Uh, some countries have done a great job at doing that, promoting it through policy. Uh, we, I, I definitely think that that would have a major impact, you know, on the economy, on the ecosystem, on growth, on investment if we took steps to um, starting to not just discover, but also to develop and test and ultimately market drugs uh, here in Canada. So there's some work to be done there. Um, first things first, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we're, we're going there in the future. Thank you for that. And we have time for one more question. If there's one more, one right there. Hi there. Um, so one of the topics that came up in your talk and came up in the previous one is all around talent. And I think that's going to be a really hot topic over the next few days. And one of the things we know is sometimes academia is not always great at showing these new trainees that there's opportunities in industry. And I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, uh, because in Canada we do a really great job of training these highly qualified personnel. And it, it, what opportunities do you see in that fundamental training we do that can really support the innovation sector and, and really get these highly qualified and highly specialized folks um, into industry, into even building their own companies? Like what fundamental changes do we need to start looking at at a systematic level? Uh, would you mind if I had a crack at that one? Um, Go for it. Uh, so uh, it, you know, this is actually a question that I, I raised a few years ago. Um, for those that don't know, for many years I was a professor at UBC and for some time was doing both, uh, uh, both leading Abcelera and uh, engaged in the enterprise of teaching and training the next generation of scientists. So I got to see this from both sides simultaneously. And I would say that there was a conspicuous lack of familiarity amongst many students, uh, grad students in particular, of what are the most exciting, interesting, you know, active areas of biomedical research. That's not to say that there's none of that, but I, I thought we could do a much better job. Um, you know, some of the things I would encourage, uh, encourage uh, universities in particular to, to think about adopting, um, you know, some simple things like sharing trade journal announcements uh, and you know, the, the, the news in biotech, so people are familiar with, you know, where, where the space is going, what people are excited on, would do a lot uh, just to build familiarity. Uh, bringing in speakers that aren't just from academia, but that are coming from some of the top, you know, pharma and biotech sectors, 
can help uh, students to recognize that there are many exciting careers in industry and that uh, you do not need uh, by any stretch of the imagination to compromise uh, doing cutting edge science for working in the private sector. In fact, in many, many times it's, it's almost the opposite. And the last, which I think we do reasonably well is looking for opportunities to have um, you know, internships and co-op programs that help to build those relationships and have both the professors and the trainees get some exposure to what it's like to work in the private sector and what the important questions are. Yeah, I would like to echo that, um, what Carl said. I am a, a professor at the same time as I am the CEO and CSO of Voxel. So I'm exactly on that point. And I think when I was a grad student, there was only maybe two options that were highlighted to me. It was or to go in academia or to go to industry. There wasn't the entrepreneurship path. So hiring co-ops and having that, uh, all those internships opportunities is definitely something that we are doing at Voxel and we hire co-ops at least three, four every, every single term. Um, and also what, what they have been seeing a shift now towards conferences and it's much more diverse now the entrepreneurship mixed with academia and conference and I think that's also helping um, for the highly qualified personnel to see what is out there. Yeah, I, I agree with all three of Carl's points and yeah, I agree with what you said. I'll just, I'll just say here's some data. I gave a talk at MIT last week to recruit people. I gave a talk at the Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research across the street in the fall, uh, and then just this afternoon, I welcomed 10 interns uh, into deep genomics. And that's just, just, I do this every month, welcome new employees into deep genomics. This month, 10 interns, plus we have PEY students, which are students that spend a year at the company. And those, those mechanisms are super important for us to bring in bright new people. Thank you all so much for that really great discussion. Um, I think we have a really hopeful and bright future. Uh, at least I'm just, that's the optimistic tone I'm going to take. And um, uh, the Canada's future is in good hands with you guys and, and, uh, and others. So thank you, Carl, Carolina, and Brendan for being here today. And I'm now going to turn it over to the next panel, which is going to be moderated by um, Manjula Selvaraja, which is going to be on Out of the Lab, Into the Patient, Canada's Commercial Opportunity in Cell and Gene Therapy Manufacturing. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Carly. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you.